Shalom. Thank you very much um, for coming, and thank you, Esti and Osnat, for inviting me. It's an absolute honor to be here. It's a very emotional day. Um, I'm very happy to be part of it. Um, as I think Osnat said, <laughs> uh, my Hebrew isn't that uh, excellent, um, I studied product design and uh, I focus on footwear. Um, I, I'm going to talk actually mostly about one project um, that kind of started percolating and starting to be part of my brain uh, when I was here in Israel a couple of years ago during the Jerusalem Center for Visual Arts uh, Residency. Um, but I will also explain a little bit where my practice is and where it's going and why it's um, a different project um, from what I uh, traditionally do. So kind of the main um, aim of my projects is to uh, look at the typology of, of women's footwear. Um, and I think it's a very interesting subject matter because I quite soon realized um, when I was designing shoes that every shoe that you see kind of um, represents a style cliche. So slutty or girly or sporty or even androgynous. They really fit in uh, very specific style cliches. And I think as a result, they, um, they kind of conform women to these roles. And my main aim is to open the, that spectrum up aesthetically, but also um, how, they, how the shoes are made. Um, so the, the main, so I'll, I'll actually show you, um, when you Google girly shoes, this is the kind of spectrum of shoes that come up. And sporty as well. So there's kind of aesthetic rules, colors, materiality um, that kind of make the shoes adhere to it. Um, then you also, of course, have shoe types, um, which are more um, kind of based in a kind of functional, with a, a functional background. So, for example, the, the brogue um, was invented for actually Scottish and Irish wetlands. So farmers would walk th over like um, extremely wet um, farmland and the, the shoes were made in such a way that the water would seep into the shoe and could very easily also seep out of it. So you could keep your feet as dry as possible. Um, and what I think is quite interesting about that is that Nowadays, a brogue um, has a very different connotation. So the, even though that the shoe is very similar in its design, it's, it's based on these um, broguing perforations, um, the context of the shoe is completely changed. Um, but rather than doing something that the fashion industry does a lot by looking at historical uh, types and designs, I'm trying to kind of make up um, my own set of rules and my own um, aesthetic and design. And I mainly do that through um, looking at different ways of producing the shoe. So I'm looking at the materiality, the, the, um, the construction of things. So this is a, a chart where you see where a kind of conventional shoe is made with um, kind of three elements that you usually see, which is the, the upper, so the, the top part of the shoe, the sole and the heel. Um, but those three elements are within this construction technique always um, separated, even though, of course, the, the shoe designers are trying to pretend that it isn't. Uh, there's still these three parts. Um, so I'm really trying to find different ways of making the shoe to become more sculptural um, with it. So this is an example of a shoe I did um, quite a long time, probably about 10 years ago now. Um, which is, it's basically, a, um, I call it leather mache. So it's a paper mache, but translated in leather. So the, the shoe traces the foot on the inside completely, but then it's built up on the outside. And what's nice about footwear, um, it's something that I, of course, as a product designer, love, is that as soon as you start changing one element of a shoe, the whole thing starts shaking. You have to design your way out of the problem that you give yourself. So, for example, the, the fact that the, the shoe can't bend in the front, you have to design a, a new way of, of walking or um, actually making that happen. So, with this shoe, the toe is actually quite high up, so you, you roll uh, your foot. So this is the same technique, but with bigger sheets, also making it more abstracted. And also, every element is part of the technique. So there's no, like every design um, uh, solution, such as the, the heel and the front, are um, yeah, come out of the technique. 
Um, this is actually the only shoe that I've ever made that cannot possibly be worn, <laughs> um, which is quite nice because most people either believe that all of them are, yeah, of course, they're shoes, so they're wearable or vice versa. But I made another version. So they're carbon fiber and cladded in, in leather. And this is the kind of the next iteration of the same shoe, this time rather than using three part molds, a two part mold, which ultimately also means that the, uh, the, the three dimensionality of this shoe, because it's, it has to be made in two parts, um, adds strength to the, to the, um, to the shoe. Um, but so that's kind of a little bit uh, some examples of shoes I've done. Um, very often I also exhibit the, the process and speak about the kind of value of uh, the machine made and handmade um, and um, how things are presented in, in the, the kind of a luxury industry. Um, but um, I soon kind of realized that in um, when you design something, um, even it's not just the process by which you make it, but it's also the process of thinking about the project um, that could do it a bit of updating or, or rethinking. So I started um, a project during a, a Stanley Picker Research Fellowship um, in 2011, where I actually looked at um, a kind of more the methodology by which you design something. So I looked at this um, factory, which is a Richard, Richard Rogers, I can never say that in one good sentence, um, where it's basically kind of a design or an engineering um, method that defines all the different parameters that this building, in his case, needed to um, adhere to. So he, just, he said, I want to make a factory floor that has absolutely no columns on the inside, which meant that all the kind of construction and the water supply, the air supply, um, the air conditioning, every kind of infrastructure is happening on the outside of the building. So by setting the parameters, you also design in some way how the, the building looks, but I'll, I'll talk about that um, a little uh, later. Um, actually, yeah, um, so this is a part that's also quite interesting. If you do work in this kind of logic way of setting parameters, um, then a kind of question came up in my mind where if, if you set up these parameters, which is kind of a logic, really kind of a logic methodology, um, then what happens to aesthetics? Is there... Um, how, do, how does that play a role in um, parametric design? And I, I kind of think, because you could ultimately say if, if you are um, designing a bridge and you set the parameters, the length, the width, the height, uh, the amount of traffic that goes over it, uh, the budget that you have, you ultimately kind of come to a certain conclusion, but ultimately I also think that a designer doesn't make those decisions separately there's a kind of built-in intuition that makes the two come together. And I actually found um, a little bit of some kind of proof of this in this book um, called Why Buildings uh, Stand Up. Um, and it's about the kind of the, the relationship between structural correctness and aesthetics. So he claims that if, if, a, if a, an I-beam isn't used in the correct structural way, it will never be a beautiful object or a beautiful um, building. But going back to the project, um, I started to define all the parameters that a shoe needs to adhere to. A shoe, of course, in a high heeled position while in motion. Um, and as you can see, as, as soon as I started writing like two or three sentences, the more questions actually are, uh, rose up um, because you, there's so many different elements that you need to make a decision on. For example, you know, what kind of movement? Is it walking? Can you, is it tiptoe? Um, and then there were also th things like, um, for example, the, the, the surface or the substrate that you walk on really changes. Uh, what this object would ultimately be like. Let's say if it was quicksand, of course, you get a completely different uh, shoe end result than on a, on a concrete um, surface. And that 
led me to kind of also looking at the shoe in a more cultural perspective. But again, I will talk about that a little bit more in, later in the um, presentation. So this is actually the so the fellowship is a is a fellowship that runs for a year and a half that is part of uh, Kingston University, uh, where you get the time and place to work with staff there. It's a university um, that's not only arts and design, but also a kind of more broader uh, university. Um, and this is, so, th so every fellowship ends up in um, an exhibition. So this is the, the exhibition uh, shot. Um, and the exhibition is called A Measurable Factor Sets the Conditions of Its Operation, which is, I will never ever <laughs> make up such a long, uh, um, title for a show because, first of all, graphically it's just awful, and um, to say it at a, at a talk, I have really uh, struggled in the past. But anyway, it's actually um, the explanation of what a parameter is. Now, if you look at engineering in footwear design, um, there's, of course, you can say that a high-heeled shoe is um, is a example of engineering where steel uh, was used probably about in the 1950s. Um, they still don't, they still um, kind of uh, in two minds about who actually um, invented it, uh, but you can say that that's a, a piece of engineering, but it hasn't changed very much since. And I think it's quite interesting to think about fashion in that, in that sense, like what engineering means in the fashion industry. Does it um, does it, what, what does it add to? What is it used for? Um, so I think in footwear, it's, it really hasn't changed that much. Even if you see quite a lot of um, kind of sculptural looking shoes recently, they're always still in, 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 in the kind of um, structural sense of it, completely conventional or, or hasn't changed in the last um, 100 years. But of course, in um, shoes and engineering, there's a lot happening in sports. Um, and these, uh, these shoes here on the right bottom, uh, they're actually shoes you wear in a mine uh, field. So they're designed um, very specifically for that. Now here there's a, a slide of um, when engineering is used in fashion, and it's, it's very often used um, to kind of um, engineer shape or posture. Um, which is, of course, not just about performance, but it's about a very particular type of uh, performance. And very often it also kind of um, changes the woman into a machine. So when the crinoline was first invented, um, there's, you know, you got all of a sudden these prints in fashion magazines that kind of pretended that the woman was actually a machine and was, yeah, kind of drawn as a... Um, engineering um, diagram. Again, going back to this project, um, what, I've, what I realized is that there were so many different parameters, so I had to kind of focus uh, on one in particular, and I studied um, kind of the, the anatomics and the kinematic movement of the foot and the leg. Um, and I read stacks and stacks of reports on footwear and what uh, what is good for you and what isn't. And of course, um, of course, every single conclusion of these reports are the same. You should not wear high heels. Um, there were even reports that combined um, wearing handbags with high heels that was even worse. <laughs> um, and all these, all these pieces of research were um, looked at um, existing shoes. So. A, a high heeled shoe of a certain height, one height higher, one another height higher, and then padding. So all really based on existing footwear. So not kind of trying to find a new way of uh, making a shoe in order to find ways. Is there actually a better way of walking, or is there um, any improvement, or are there any opportunities possible? Um, so I, I took that as a kind of starting point, and first I. Um, because it's not just about movement, of course, but it's also the mold on which you make the shoe that is very important. Um, so I made um, a specific shoe last. 
Um, and I worked with a company that is the, the last, last manufacturer. The mold for shoe is called the, the last uh, in the UK. And found out quite a lot of interesting things. First of all, that, there, that the people that work there have very little anatomic um, understanding of the foot. Um, something that is really not that necessary because it's really, the last isn't made for just the food, but it's also made for the footwear industry. So, um, for example, the, the sole of the foot um, is very flat. That's just because in a factory it's much easier to make a flat material um, than it is to mold something or to have something more three-dimensional. So all these decisions, they're kind of an, an amalgamation of what is good for the foot and that what the shoe industry needs or requires. Um, and actually, it's, it's probably since the kind of 1850s that shoes even had a left and a right. Um, and we're kind of going back to that uh, again. Even in, in men's footwear, um, lasts are, are becoming more and more kind of ambiguous non-shoe shoe foot shapes. So here you see um, the two last, the, the top one is the new one that I produced and the bottom one is a kind of more standard um, last. So this is the, the last actually that I produced, um, just physical but on a kind of rig um, because I had to input um, various um, um, measurements in the computer. So I had a physical one that I measured and then translated it to uh, Rhino, actually, in the computer. So this is one of, um, I guess, screenshot of, of the exhibition. So you see here the different last developments, and then behind there I'll explain. Um, so derived from all these different anatomic uh, research, um, I produced 17 different hypotheses for shoe configurations. Um, and those shoe configurations, they, they map out all the different um, contact points. So that what holds um, the foot or the shoe onto the foot, um, that what touches the floor, and that what keeps the, the foot in a high heeled um, position. And these contact points, um, they, 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 I really designed them um, from these studies, so every, every one of these 17 hypotheses has something to do with how we walk or how we move, um, or how the, foot, how the foot works, and it really completely ignores how any of these shoes are made, because if you look at a shoe, um, even if you didn't need a complete strap over your foot, if you just needed like a pinpoint to keep your foot in place, um, in order to make that possible in the shoe industry means that you need to sandwich and everything that's, that goes over the foot under the sole. So everything goes from under the sole, over the foot and back under. Um, so you wouldn't be able to, for example, have a floating strap uh, or even a floating dots to keep your foot in place. Does that, does that make sense? Um, <laughs> I know it's always a bit difficult to explain this, this uh, process. Um, but yeah, so this is a really kind of um, conventional structure. Um, so I'll explain uh, with one of the hypotheses. Um, so the foot actually has um, the heel bone on the side of the foot, really on the, on the outside of the foot. So if you're actually walking on a high heel, um, which always ends really bang in the middle, um, it's actually not, you, you're not standing on your bone, which you might think that you are, but the heel is really on the side of the foot. Um, also, when we walk barefoot, uh, you see here this line. So when you, um, when you roll your foot, you actually land on the, on the outside side of the foot where this bone is, and you propel with your big toe. So it really goes through this kind of um, yeah, rolling motion of the foot. You really don't do that, but you go a bit more like that. So from, that, from knowing this, um, I thought, well, if that's the case, then why does a heel really need to be bang in the middle of the foot? Why can't it be on the side um, of the foot? And how does that maybe promote uh, a more natural or barefoot way of, of walking, even though you're, of course, elevated? Um, and then one thing that might, of course, happen is um, you 
Eve, Eve, there's e version and inversion, your, so your food also kind of makes that uh, movement. Um, which, of course, if you have a, a heel on the side of your foot, will um, kind of happen more easily because you'll get um, you'll have more to balance with, or you have to balance better. Um, so one thing that I thought of um, to prevent that from happening is to have some kind of ring around your foot that makes sure that you you can't actually make that movement anymore, which looks something like this. And then, of course, um, the, I wanted to split the sole so you could, um, so your foot actually can, can roll better because then you're not inhibited by the kind of um, straightness of the, of the sole. So I inputted that uh, in the computer like this. So these are, these are this, so this is one of these constellations or these, these contact points. Um, but then I also made them into physical parts. So I designed it in such a way that there's a, an outer shell that these parts sit within that I can then uh, test. So this is one of, the, one of these outcomes. And then, of course, for the exhibition, I also wanted to aestheticize this kind of research um, because it's also quite interesting, our kind of belief in, in engineering and what, it's, what it means. So they actually screen printed them which again, crazy, if you have like really thin dotted lines, screen printing is not made for that, plotting is. <laughs> but uh, one in like 20 prints worked. So, so these are some of the other constellations that I produced. And here you see five of them um, in a row, different. Um, Positionings, and then I actually so I did quite a lot of this research um, into the the working of the foot with the sports science department in Kingston, and they have amazing equipment. Um, they have so behind here you see these all these cameras. They're basically a motion capture set, and they don't uh, unfortunately work like you would imagine in film industry, but they really work very particularly with the movement of the body. Um, and therefore, the, the imagery that it creates is more like a grainy kind of, um, um, almost like an X-ray-like vision. Um, and then what I wanted to do, which for me was more important, is um, a pressure map test. So it, it shows you um, where your pressure um, develops from when you walk. So I have some footage of that. So this is a, a barefoot, so you see this motion and then the peak toe where you end propelling from. And then the next one is a heel. So it's really high peak pressure moment and then it rolls to the side and then over. So you can see that you, you still make that a similar movement as you would do um, on a high heel, but kind of broken into two motions. One, first where you land and then where you propel. Um, so here are some more of these uh, testing pieces, which of course also become more um, aesthetic than um, test, real testing pieces, because ultimately, um, because I wanted all these 17 pieces to fit into one um, method of research, you kind of um, test a lot of things that you ultimately don't really want to test, like the let's say, the, the quality of the, the, the plastic or the abrasion of the plastic, you ultimately also test. So at the moment, um, I'm thinking of really going back to where these 17 hypotheses come from and making a better testing method for each individual one so I can actually make um, real proposals for footwear. Um, but then, of course, this kind of rationalized approach to footwear design um, is, is one thing, but footwear is, of course, um, also a very um, a cultural um, object. Um, and so I've, um, I've also looked at different uh, kind of um, associations that we have with footwear, very clumsy, fr frivolous um, motions. And one thing that I, um, that I did, actually, for the exhibition, I borrowed um, to Moybridge slides, which um, in Kingston there's a, there's a museum that has the largest collection of his work because he's lived there uh, for a large part of his, 
of his life. And I had the absolute pleasure of going to the museum and actually looking at these slides really up close. And I, you know, first I thought, you know, I know Mulley Bridge, et cetera, but then I started looking quite closely. And well, one thing that every um, curator of Moybridge sees when they see these slides is, of course, the difference between how men, women, and animals are depicted. So, of course, the animal's very uh, clinic um, depiction of movement, really kind of as, as objective as you can get. Um, but the men are all doing sports activities. Um, they're, <laughs> they're boxing, they're running, they're jumping, they're doing all these kinds of things. Um, and the women are doing absolute uh, culturally informed activities. Um, and um, some of them, so this is one of the slides, for example, that I borrowed, which contain activities that are uh, not so objective and are also um, very particular. And um, some of them that just don't make sense in these kinds of slides. So for example, here's the, the, the classic moment of a woman um, dropping a handkerchief, which of course is a kind of love play, <laughs> uh, which you do not do on your own. So there's this moment that is really kind of made up um, and acted out by just herself. And then there, there's this slide, which I also thought was very interesting, um, where you really kind of wonder how Moybridge um, uh, instructed these women to act. Um, because here on the beginning, you see this woman really pose, like she knows exactly how to be on the floor with her, uh, her hand under her, uh, under her neck with, on the floor, kind of lying elegantly. Um, but then as the camera starts rolling, which I imagine was quite a kind of snap, snap, snap moment, um, she then needs to do something. And I don't quite, you kind of see in this image that she, isn't that she is aware of herself as a model, as, a, as someone acting, but then at the very end you see her kind of, so yeah, she's picking something from the floor, maybe a daisy, kind of ditzy thing. Um, and then at the very end, she just looks really clumsy, like just not knowing what the hell <laughs> Moybridge might have wanted from her. So I think there's a really lovely kind of um, story behind it and potentially also a link to kind of early fashion photography or even the understanding of women, how they see themselves as um, these kind of cultural beings. Um, so that, that was part of the, the gallery display, I had these two slides. Um, but I also had other cultural um, references, which um, are actually a little bit more about the, um, the substrates that I talked about earlier. Um, it was basically a series of film clips where shoes play a role. Um, one of them, so I think the, the high-heeled um, the a high heeled woman is a very complex construct and it's, it's ultimately made for uh, the man-made environment. It's not made for rural areas. It's really set up to work in very specific places. And as soon as you subject this woman to either different substrates or narrative, it really, she starts to change her identity and change who she is. Um, and of course, there's a lot of classic moments. Um, so for example, this is um, A Night of the Living Dead. And it's this moment where there's a chase scene and a woman falls, a uh, heel falls off, and it, she's really used to create suspense in the film. Um, so here's the, the actual clip. I don't. I think I have. No, there's no sound on it. Um, and the next clip is uh, one from uh, Dynasty, or Dynasty, I don't know how you pronounce it here, um, which is quite interesting. It also talks about uh, materials. I think. Don't you ever stop trying to screw up Blake's life and mine. Look, you know how those reporters are. I know how you are. Blake told me about your would-be seduction. How could you possibly think he could ever be interested in you again? Maybe all I really need is just a little more time. I'm not finished. <laughs> Stupid bitch! Look what you've done to this outfit! 
I've never seen you looking better. And by the way, Blake's mine, and you're never going to have him. I don't want him! You can keep him! So, of course, um, I think what's really interesting in that moment is that, first of all, when are these two women ever outside, outside a swimming pool setting? Like, all of a sudden, they're in the woods, um, something that really pokes fun at them and who they are, and um, also at this kind of early 90s uh, fashion that really is made for the man-made environment. It's not, but putting them outside that, uh, out there, comfort zone, they really, the, I think the director really pokes fun at them and at, of course, the series itself. Um, but it also, of course, speaks of very specific shoe fetish um, that has very, has very specific uh, materialities that they're interested in. Um, and going beyond that, there's another two clips um, that I showed simultaneously. Um, which is um, Jewel in the Sun and uh, La Dolce Vita. And on the left screen, you will see um, Jewel in the Sun, which is this love story um, in dry heat, uh, really very passionate. Uh, and on the other side of the screen is, um, of course, the Trivi Fountain, which is the wettest um, moment in film history, but it is really completely... Um, the, the actress is comp completely sexually aloof to her um, counterpart. shot each other and, and they actually both died in three. One of my most, rom most romantic films. So the next clip uh, is again something about a kind of materiality. It's a clip from uh, Red Desert. Um, and the, the main character um, is walking through a kind of wasteland. Uh, but at some point, uh, which you will really see in her facial expression, realizes in what kind of environment, what kind of uh, industrially polluted environment she is.
Um, so in, in response to these um, kind of film clips that were playing on one side of the gallery, I created my own um, um, series of, of films of uh, foot walking through different substrates, kind of hinting at the different um, identities that they all pose upon who's ever above that um, shot. Um, and I was spot, uh, shot on a, a high-speed camera in f 500 frames per second. I started, actually, um, also in Kingston University. So you have to imagine that this is super quick. It's really one step, and it's incredible um, speed, it slowed down. And speed. You can ask me for recipes at the end of the... <laughs> I think in total I shot, um, I think, 11 different uh, materials. And I'll, I'll show the, actually the, the footage of um, shooting it. So because it's such a high-speed camera, and normally you um, film at 25, 24 frames a second, you actually need a lot of light coming in. So we used this one spotlight, which in this photograph you can't tell, but it was actually almost impossible to look against that light, so it's super hot. Um, there's a cake in, in one of the sequences that, you know, within seconds, gonna, uh, yeah, the, the, the cream uh, melted. Um, so it's a, it's a 4,000K uh, lamp, um, which, if you think, like, at, at 12 o'clock during the day, um, the sunlight is about 6,000K, so it was really extremely strong light, which also means that because we only had one, um, because sometimes you, if you have two lights, it starts to make interference because it's, you really shoot it um, so slowly. Um, 
So we actually bounced all the lights. So there's lights in front of me, but also behind me. And that's the um, cinematographer pair um, who both Norm and I have worked with in the past, doing the light setup. And here you see um, me walk through it. And then, of course, all the cleaning. <laughs> it was two days of, of basically cleaning involved. Um, and that's what I wanted to say today. So thank you.